welcome to you from wherever you're watching across Africa and beyond. It's that special time when we look into matters African. On the show tonight, we feature former president of Nigeria, Olesegun Obasanjo. He shares powerful insights into Africa. You get to have your say too. And we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. Olusegun Obasanjo has been a teacher, a military man, a diplomat and a president. He joins us to share some deep insights into leadership and his vision for Africa. But first, let's take a look at his own journey in leadership. Born in southwest Nigeria in 1937, Olusegun Obasanjo had a 21-year military career where, amongst other things, he served in a UN peacekeeping mission in the former Zaire and commanded the 3rd Marine Commando Division during the Biafra Civil War of 1967 to 1970. In 1975, he was appointed Housing Minister, then Chief of Staff. The assassination of General Mutala Mohamed in 1976 saw him rise to military ruler where he remained until 1979 when he presided over democratic elections seeking not to run himself. He was the first military leader in Nigeria to hand over power to a democratically elected government. In 1988, he founded the African Leadership Forum and three years later made a failed attempt to become Secretary General of the UN. In 1995, Obasanjo was jailed by the military ruler Sani Abacha who accused him of plotting a coup. Obasanjo was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, International pressure from newly elected South African President Nelson Mandela, former US President Jimmy Carter and German Chancellor Hamut Schmidt forced Abacha to commit the sentence to 15 years. Following the death of Abacha, Obasanjo was released from prison in 1998 and in 1999 he won the presidential elections running with 62% of the vote on the People's Democratic Party PDP ticket. He served as President of Nigeria from 1999 to 2007. Time now to get his insights into Africa. Thank you so much for making time for the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Now we've been studying and analyzing leadership on the African continent, development and the growth that we are seeing across many parts of Africa. You've been a teacher, you've been a military officer, a president, a diplomat, a prisoner. The, 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 the spectrum has been so wide. Just looking back on your experience and journey in African leadership, what are your thoughts? Well, there are those who said um, leaders are born and they are not made. And there are those who said leaders are made and uh, not born. There are those who said leaders create circumstances and there are those who said circumstances create leaders. I think there's a bit of all this in, uh, in, in, in a good leader. Um, you must have been born with a certain amount of innate qualities which you will need to be developed. And of course, if those innate qualities are not developed, then you don't rise uh, to the level that you could have risen to uh, as a leader. Um, then, of course, again, there are opportunities which come in your life. And um, when those opportunities come, um, you have to rise to the occasion or not rise to the occasion. Now, if you rise admirably to the occasion, then you are shown up as a leader. So the big question, the failures of Africa, many people have blamed over decades on what they described as failure of leadership. Yeah. 
in your opinion, is Africa improving when it comes to leadership? No way. Surely we are improving. Um, let me give you an example to um, uh, underline the improvement the improvement that uh, we are making. I had opportunity, a unique opportunity, to be a military head of state from 1976 to 1979. And I had to deal essentially with what I would call the first post-independence African leaders. Whatever you may say about them, almost all of them, they gave us independence, some with a little bit of struggle, some uh, by protest, some with a gun in their hand, but we got independence. Their emphasis was essentially on political issues. And it's understandable, too. Um, but I came back 20 years later, after I left in 1979, I came back in 1999 as an elected president. The crop of leaders that I had to deal with uh, were a bit younger, a bit, a bit just a little bit younger, <laughs> a little bit younger, yeah. a little bit younger, mm -hmm. better exposed mm -hmm. across the board, not only politics, but economics, cultural, but still not enough, still not enough. I, I will say from what I have seen, coming up in the uh, second decade, second decade of the 21st century, there's improvement. In age, again, still younger. In the exposure that they had had, again, better. Now, talking of exposure, Walim Julius Nyarere used to tell me the story of how he became chief minister. He was a teacher. He led a party. He became, uh, and his party won the election. And then he was appointed chief minister. Except for his university training, his uh, exposure, or the uh, as he was growing up and his experience as a teacher. There was nothing else that prepared him for leadership. And he had and to first, deal with, with such monumental yes, issues. Monumental, it was a huge yeah. time of change. Mm -hmm. And then the first day in, in the office as chief minister, his secretary came to him and said, well, Mr. Chief Minister, when you want to write a minute, to the governor. You start with Y-E. You make your point succinctly, you initial, and you put the date. That was all the lesson he had, all the exposure he had to prepare him for leadership, for running the affairs of, of the his nation. country. And of course, he was writing many to everybody who sat Y.E. Secretary, Y.E. Until he wrote one to his own secretary, and his secretary ran to him and said, hey, no, 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 no. Mr. Chief Minister, there's only one Y.E. It's and not said, for everybody. <laughs> I said, well, look, what exactly does Y.E. mean? So why mean? Y.E. means your excellency, <laughs> and it's only the governor that is <laughs> excellent. All the other people are not excellent. Now, that, that, that shows you the type of 
exposure, preparation, and all that that I, I talk about. But some of our people now coming in, they have been minister, they have been uh, parliamentarian, they have been... They've studied uni <coughs> universally. Yeah. They've, they've yeah. So and um, <coughs> we, are, we, are, we are improving. Let's come to the chat. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing it. It just puts into perspective the challenge that our leaders at that time faced. Mm. And, and with all the repression, having to stand up and take control of, of nation states was, was incredible. Let's talk about the challenges Africa faces right now. Let's start with a very serious challenge of insecurity. Insecurity posed by various conflicts. There's insecurity posed um, by terrorism. There's insecurity posed by climate change. We're seeing poaching. What are your thoughts on, on, on this very dynamic issue? I, I think insecurity is one major problem that Africa faces today. But I will this aggregate this insecurity by saying there are those that are internally generated, there are, all, there are those that are externally imposed, mm. and they more or less feed on themselves. Let's start with internally generated insecurity. Wherever you have injustice, you will have protest, you will have reaction. Now the way the protest or reaction comes will depend on the magnitude, real or perceived, level of that injustice. Whether it's political injustice, whether it's economic injustice, whether it is social injustice, any form of injustice generate is a potent source of insecurity mm -hmm. because people will they will react. Will react. Now <clears throat> And then let us look at our society. How much injustice is there? How much inequity is there? How much discrimination is there? How much nepotism is there? How much corruption is there? These are all sources of injustice. And when these come together and you get insecurity, you don't blame it on anybody. You blame it on the leadership mm. that failed to do what it should have done. And as I always say, you have an airline. I have an airline. Your airline is performing better. The same make of aircraft. And mine is not performing. And we are going through, we are going on the same route. What is the difference? Service. The service you give in your airline, mm -hmm. which is much better than mine. So, and the same goes. Boils down to leadership and service. Leadership. If, if leadership is addressing the issues, yeah. it will contain yeah. security matters. Yeah. And then, of course, like you rightly said, the external, uh, externally imposed um, um, climate change, uh, terrorism from outside and all that. Um, that, of course, cannot be dealt with alone by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to join hands with the international community to deal with it. But let me just say something yes. on a lighter note here. Yes. <laughs> um, the climate change. Mm. Uh, people have said, look, what do we do? We should uh, watch how we, uh, our, the, the, the type of development that 
Europe and North Af uh, America uh, embraced to get them to where they are now, which was the one that really polluted uh, uh, the atmosphere. Our world. Yeah, mm -hmm. our world. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot go their, their way. I agree. But some of my friends, and I have sympathy for them, have said, look, let us join in in doing in, uh, in getting our own development. And if we have to add a little bit to the pollution of the world, let us add, but let us develop. And we can all join hands to clean it up. <laughs> after, after we have developed. I think Africa does face the challenge of how do we develop but develop green yeah. in, in this new environment. So some people advocating for a little bit of pollution yeah, yeah. <laughs> to move forward. Um, I, I, I think, you know, that, that is a huge challenge. We've talked about security. Let's talk about opportunities. What yeah. do you think are the greatest opportunities for the African continent? The greatest opportunity for African countries. That, look, we have everything going for us. 60% of the arable land in the world mm. is Africa. We have huge, huge demographic advantage. Our population are 60% of our population are under the age of 25 or, or, or 30. Huge. And I don't see population as a liability. When your population is well educated, well trained, well skilled, it is a fantastic asset, as an opportunity. And then, particularly in the last three or four years, the world is looking more and more to Africa for investment, where they can get very substantial return on their investment. We should maximize all these opportunities. And then, of course, before we used to talk about Africa and uh, non-democracy, non-good governance, we are not there yet. But we are making progress. We are moving. And we are moving. Mm -hmm. uh, here you have just had an election. Five years ago, it was a different story from this. Even though now this last one was challenged, but it was handled in the most civilized way, mm -hmm. which is credit to all the people of Kenya. And something that we, all of us Africans, can be proud of. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. The 1990s, a difficult time. You spent a, some time in prison. Talk us through that period. What, what got me there? I think I was too much of a Democrat. I think that, that really is, is the point. Because I was a little bit outspoken. And I said that politics is not for the military. And if by any act of omission or commission, any soldier found himself in politics, he must get himself out of it as quickly as possible. The man we had at the helms of affairs of Nigeria then, called Abacha, had a plan to perpetuate himself as Nigerian head of state for a lifetime. And um, what he decided to do to get there is to take some of us who he thought that whatever anybody may think of us, that um, they could keep us in the cooler. 
Mm. Um, I was, as at that time, one of those Nigerians we regard as um, respected. Uh, Influ state, influential. Uh, well, state, uh, statesman. So he has to put me in the cooler. He put my number two when I was in government in the cooler. He put the, he um, uh, removed the most respected uh, traditional ruler, the Sultan of Sokoto. He removed him and put him in the cooler. Well, when he had done that, now who will dare say or raise a finger against him? And um, so he decided that what to do is to uh, have a trumped up charge of uh, coup against me. And, um, and that, that's, that's how I got there. You, you put it very simply, you say, put, put us in the cooler. <laughs> Obviously, being in that process, is, is, it's, a, it's a difficult, challenging time. It's a terrifying time. When you came out, how did you get through, first of all? What was your mindset as you were sitting there? And then when you came out, what was your vision? My dear sister, I, I initially I thought, oh, look, uh, they must have made a mistake. Uh, oh, is it a mistake? Uh, is it mistaken identity? Um, because I couldn't think of anybody um, thinking that I would be planning a coup. I had opportunity, like we said earlier on, mm -hmm. to remain there. When I was there, nobody would have, uh, I could have, uh, if, if I didn't remain as a military man, mm -hmm. I could have you could gone have run. to an uh, mm -hmm. uh, election and I would have won. Um, so for anybody to, in his right mind, to say I was uh, planning a coup, um, it, it uh, beat my imagination. Mm. Um, then, uh, gradually, I came to realize that this was a, 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 an orchestrated, a, a premeditated uh, action. So, <clears throat> the day I was, uh, uh, actually sentenced, what flashed through my mind is, wow, I'm ruined for life. You're ruined, that's how. Yeah, I said, look, wow, I'm ruined for life. And then quickly, within 30 seconds, came back to, I came back to my senses and said, no, 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 no. I couldn't have been ruined for life. This is the action of a, of a man. Now, I don't know what God will do, but God will do his best. So I succumbed. I was then taken to a place uh, they call Inter Center um, in Lagos. Uh, I was uh, told that nobody, sh oh, no, no, I wasn't told. The other inmates were told not to. Talk in, to you. Not to talk to, to me. So mm -hmm. I was virtually isolated mm -hmm. after about uh, three months or so, I was taken to Intercenter and I remained there for almost three months. Uh, from there, I was then taken to the prison in Jos, where which was supposed to be my place of uh, abode mm. for uh, 15 years. My um, life sentence had been um, reduced to 15 years imprisonment and then so I have conditioned myself uh, that well look if I uh, um, if I, I uh, if I was regarded as being of good behavior I will only spend two thoughts so so you had resigned yourself to, to being in prison for, for many years for 10 years at minimum mm. 10 years and um, when my wife came to me to see me in just I said look uh, Madam, this is what I've resigned myself to do. And she said, are you out of your mind? I bet you haven't done anything wrong. I said, yes, I haven't done anything wrong, but here I am. And so that you can prepare your mind and prepare yourself. Uh, I have, for this challenge. Yeah. For this. And then because I was having 
Because people were coming to see me in Jaws. They thought that Jaws was too sophisticated for me. And they sent me to Yola. Jaws was a prison built during the colonial period. And in fact, um, they have cells for uh, white prisoners. Um, that was, uh, I was told later that that was one of the reasons why I was sent there. But uh, when uh, my jailer uh, thought that um, you now I was too comfortable there, mm. and he sent me to Yola. Yola was a native authority prison. Um, so it was tough. It was tough. When you came out, going through that period, some people can come out very bitter and emboldened by the anger and the bitterness. Some people can come out very focused and like Nelson Mandela, focused on, on development and, and, and unity and growth. What was your mindset when you came well, out? Well, um, f first of all, I wasn't bitter. Initially, I, I was, I must confess. You know, when I was in the um, intercenter, uh, the only thing I was allowed to read was the Bible. And I went into the book of Psalms. All the places where David was raining abuses and curses on his enemy, I know them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sooner than later, I started thinking, well, look, maybe he didn't know any better. Maybe he even knew better. But what did Stephen, what did Stephen do? He prayed for them. Mm. What did Jesus Christ do? Mm. He prayed for them. So when I got, by the time I got to just, I, I became a different man. And he lost his son in a uh, plane crash. Mm. And I wrote a letter of condolence. To Sonia Abacha. To Sonia Abacha. The prison uh, authorities couldn't believe it. And um, then, all the same, I was sent to Yola. But, in Yola, I was able to concentrate on doing things that I believe are more than, uh, slightly more than normal, because I was praying and fasting and praying and fasting. And I wrote within a space of less than three years, uh, I wrote four books. So you yeah. had, you, you were able to grow your fortitude yes. and to engage and, and do productive yeah. things even in that yeah. time. I wrote, and then at one stage I said, look, I said, a portion of the prison, I went to the authorities, I said, give it to me. They said, what will you do? It's an uh, area that we throw hmm. things. Hmm. I said, look, I want to use it to farm. You farm. Uh, farm. They gave it to me, and I turned it to a maize farm. And um, every year, every prisoner and every prison officer will get a cob of corn wow. from this, my farm. This is an incredible story, and thank you for sharing that. Life is therefore a challenge. Yeah. Nothing comes easy. No. So a lot of people sitting down, waiting for a job, looking at... Uh, people who have made it in life and who are successful in saying, you know, I'll never get there, how do I get there? Mm -hmm. Having gone through these challenges and learned everything that you've learned, what would you say? I would say, I would repeat the old saying, no condition is permanent in life, none. And if you do not find yourself in a situation that you want to find yourself. Create a situation better than the one you find yourself. Make the best of that situation. I found myself in prison. That's not the place I would want to find myself. So what did I do? I turned to praying and fasting. I turned to writing. And of course they normally see what you write. So. My wife became a very adept smuggler. Adept <laughs> smuggler of my work, my uh, manuscript, yeah. and smuggler of writing materials to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, he would bring uh, a, a bag with false bottom, mm. 
No. And <laughs> now, of course, when he comes, when she uh, she came, mm. the uh, prison superintendent will be there and say, well, look, uh, uh, bring this uh, uh, um, uh, milk and a thing for you. And I say, okay, uh, I will take it. I know that. Uh, There's a false material. bottom there yeah. with your material. And then I put what I have. Yeah. Uh, mm. um, but I think that is the thing. So to, uh, a friend of mine wrote me in prison. I said, look, uh, I had wanted to come to see you, but the authorities would not allow me to come. And um, so I wrote back to him. I said, well, look, uh, don't bother yourself, but send me some, uh, a couple of bags of uh, fertilizer. <laughs> and then he said that was what made his life because he was wondering that, was I getting depressed? What would be the uh, condition of my mm -hmm. mind? And, but he said when he got that letter, he said, no, 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 this man will be... He's uh, going to be just fine. It, it's, uh, it's fine. Because if he knew that, uh, if he still remember that you need fertilizer yeah. to grow maize, <laughs> then... <laughs> It's okay. It's, it's mine, it's there. So it's, it's a message of positivity. Yes. There's no permanent conviction. No permanent. And that make, make, when you find yourself in a position, look, whatever position you find yourself, you won't be the first to be in that position, and you won't be the last. Finally, I would like you to look into the camera and give African leadership and the African citizenry your words of encouragement and wisdom. Well, <clears throat> leaders, you are ordained by God. They don't play God. And know that not only in this world, but in the world to come, you have to account for the trust that God has put in your hand. Citizens, yeah, know that God ordained leaders, but leaders have to be fair, just, equitable, and transparent, and be ready to account to you and to God. But also remember, as a citizen, you have a role to play. You have a role to play because you have certain obligations. You have certain rights. I like the human right aspect that we have been touting all along. But there's also human responsibility and citizen's obligation. And when the leadership does his own and followership does its own, we will get there fast. Thank you. And so we will be up there. Thank you so much for your time, Papa. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I am Olusha Gumabasanto, former president of Nigeria, and I am watching African Leadership Dialogue. What a fascinating interview. Now, Obasanjo, we mentioned before, has been so many things. We can add farmer to the list of things that he's done in his life as he farmed while in prison. We love your thoughts on the issues. Let's take a look at what you have to say. This week, we asked you, in your own view, how can Afghan governments provide increased peace and improved security across the continent? Justin Charlo says, To increase peace and improve security, I think African governments should first streamline the security sector because they seem to be run by incompetent and corrupt officials. One would ask how armed terrorists would coexist with citizens without the security organs being aware. Again, they also need to involve the people in this matter through a well-coordinated community policing since the people are the end of security and peace and simply not the means. Ramadan Mohammed says, by harmonizing security mechanisms, working together, 
trans-border efforts and strategies and incorporating techno-security instruments. Personally, I think that African governments can provide peace and improved security across the continent by one, uniting and working together. Uh, second thing that can be done is by breaking down barriers. Um, another thing is by adapting and implementing uh, common strategies in developing agendas, which will eventually bring about mutual trust in the countries within the, the continent. And now, Africa's top 10. On Africa's top 10 this week, we look at African countries with the greatest military power. This is according to Global Firepower 2013. Starting us off at number 10 is Ghana. The armed forces personnel are active duty military personnel, including paramilitary forces. Their personnel stands at 15,500, as was last reported in 2010. Morocco takes position 9. The Royal Armed Forces of Morocco is made up of Royal Moroccan Air Force, Defence Forces and Navy, including Marines. They have military personnel of approximately 198,000. At number 8 is Uganda. The Uganda People's Defence Force, UPDF, previously the National Resistance Army, is the armed forces of Uganda. The International Institute for Strategic Studies estimates that UPDF has a total strength of 40 to 45,000 and consists of land forces and an air wing. Uganda has been pivotal in efforts to liberate and stabilize Somalia. At number 7 is Libya. Historically, Libya has had one of the largest military forces on the continent, but following the Libyan revolution in 2011, the previous army was disbanded and the Libyan National Army was created. The Libyan military currently has between 35,000 and 40,000 personnel made up of ground forces, an air force and navy. They have 500 tanks, 800 rocket projectors, 621 aircraft, a frigate and a corvette. Coming in at number 6 is Kenya. The Kenya Defence Forces is comprised of an army, navy and air force. With just over 24,000 active personnel, it is one of the smaller forces on the continent. However, the nation's strategic location means that the Kenyan military has been highly active since its inception. Kenya's arsenal includes 186 tanks, 12 rocket projectors, 148 aircraft and 78 helicopters. Kenya's military have worked closely with Somali's military, other East African forces including Uganda and Amisom in order to liberate Somalia. Algeria comes in at number 5. The Algerian military is known as the People's National Army. The force is both large and well equipped with more than 120,000 active personnel. They are supplied mainly by Russia and China. The military is comprised of an army, navy and air force. Algeria's military has an impressive tally of 1,050 tanks. They also reportedly have 148 rocket projectors, 409 aircraft, 136 helicopters, 3 corvettes and 3 submarines. At number 4 is Nigeria. The Nigerian armed forces are made up of close to 500,000 personnel split between the army, navy and the air force. They are very active in combined peacekeeping efforts on the continent. Nigeria has 363 tanks, 294 aircraft and 84 helicopters. The Nigerian army in particular has been active internally, primarily in the north of the country. Positioned at number 3 is South Africa. The South African National Defence Force is comprised of the South African Army, Navy and Air Force as well as Military Health Service. The country's arsenal includes 250 tanks, 240 rocket projectors, 235 aircraft and 3 submarines. While South Africa is one of the smaller armies in terms of personnel, they are considered the most advanced military in terms of technology in Africa. At number 2 is Ethiopia. Ethiopia's military is made up of an army and an air force. The nation has the second strongest military on the African continent as a result of both their large population and their long independence from colonialism. The country's active involvement in international peacekeeping efforts in various conflicts all over the continent has also honed their defense force. 
As of 2012, Ethiopia reportedly had around 150,000 personnel in the ground forces and a further 3,000 Air Force personnel. Global Firepower reports that they have just over 300 tanks, 147 aircraft and 68 helicopters in their arsenal. And at number one this week is Egypt. Egypt is the first African country to make the list at 14th place in the world. The Egyptian military has four main service branches, the Army, Navy, Air Force and Air Defense Command. Egypt has more than 800 military aircraft and 200 helicopters. The Egyptian Navy reportedly has two corvettes and four submarines in addition to various other vessels. One of the reasons Egypt ranks so highly is due to the support from international allies. In many instances, the support takes the form of equipment. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. We end the show this week with a quote from a young African woman who is making an impact in Botswana through her foundation, Pillar of Hope. Her name is Gigi Faladi. And Gigi said, stop asking and start doing. It's your responsibility to change the world. And with that, we close the show. I'm Julie Ishuru. I'll see you again next week. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.